Okay, our next speaker is Jared Decker. Wow, that came out really yellow. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I'm glad that we've already had a discussion about um, what it means to do uh, genomic prediction. Um, and basically, genomic prediction has had a very, uh, a very large impact in agricultural species. So Kurt Van Tassel was one of the people who led development of genomic selection and genomic prediction in dairy cattle. And he's been noted to say that uh, he doesn't need any stinking genes, right? All they need is the markers, and they can use that information to create their genomic predictions. And for a while, I probably would have agreed with Kurt and not have a problem with it. Um, but I think the results from some of the things that I'll show you today is why that's not necessarily the case. But in, in Holstein, this works great. So um, the recent publication in PNAS describing the impact on uh, the rate of genetic change in Holstein cattle with the uh, advancement of genomic prediction. In beef cattle, we don't have it uh, as simple or as lucky as they do in dairy cattle. So in beef cattle, we have lots of different breeds. In dairy cattle, if you create a genomic prediction for Holstein cattle, your work is basically done. So in beef cattle, if you design a prediction in one population, in one breed, and use that genomic prediction in the same breed, it works very well. If you try to create that genomic prediction in one breed and apply it to a second breed, uh, that fails uh, quite miserably. If you train your genomic prediction in both populations, in both breeds, uh, you can do, uh, you do as well or slightly worse than a breed-specific genomic prediction. And, and so part of my work is uh, designing genomic predictions to be used in the beef industry. And so if we can solve this problem uh, of genomic predictions that work across populations, uh, we'll have an impact. One of the thoughts that I had is that um, the individual markers simply don't have strong enough linkage disequilibrium with the, the causal mutations. And so here, the, the red diamond and the orange diamond are two causal mutations uh, in, uh, that, that have uh, two different origins in, in different breeds. And so the marker closest to them um, is a very poor predictor because you can have that homozygous genotype in three different populations, um, but it'll basically have no uh, linkage disequilibrium across those three populations or, or very weak uh, predictor. So, but the haplotypes of the five SNPs surrounding those causal mutations will be in much stronger linkage disequilibrium with the causal mutations. So we use a data set from six different breeds, a uh, small number of animals per each of the breed, um, and, and, and so we'll use all of the, the data together uh, across the breeds. This is a heat map of the genomic prediction, uh, uh, excuse me, of the genomic relationship matrix. Um, and, and so each animal is a row and a column. The diagonals, of course, are the uh, one plus the inbreeding coefficient. And so we have the, the Angus cattle. And one thing to note is that for Charlet, Limousine, Mainanju, and Semitol, the, those sires were bred to commercial Angus um, dams. So that's why we see these uh, relationships on the off-diagonal. The Hereford sires were mated to Hereford dams, and so we don't see those relatedness on the cross-diagonal. We do a lot of different um, cross-validations with this data set. Um, the first that we do is we leave a breed out. So we train our genomic prediction on five of the breeds, and we leave the sixth breed out. And so we do that iteratively for all of the breeds. The other thing that we do is we do k-means threefold cross-validation. And so we take each, all of the Angus animals, and we use k-means to break those uh, 600 Angus up into three different groups. And, and so we can also iterate over those three um, k-mean clusters. 
For the haplotype construction, basically we, we went through, we fit a uh, genomic prediction model, and we pulled out the, uh, the SNPs with the largest allele substitution effects. We made sure that the SNPs were, were spaced uh, far enough apart so that none of our haplotypes would overlap, and we created the haplotype with the core SNP and the two flanking SNPs on either side of that core SNP. And then we created an incidence matrix of those haplotypes. Uh, we used the Bayesian sparse uh, linear mixed models to fit our uh, genomic predictions. And we did the validations as I described uh, previously and just looked at the correlations between the breeding values and the phenotypes. One of the questions that we had is what was the best way to pick these QTLs? So the first analysis, we did an individual uh, genomic uh, prediction model within each of the six breeds and picked the top um, hits from, from each of those individual breed analyses. We also did an analysis across all six breeds at the same time and picked out the top uh, hits from that analysis. And then uh, one of the things that we were curious about is does picking um, the top hits based on the trait matter? So we picked the top hits from one trait, in this case marbling, the amount of fat in the uh, flex in the, in the meat, and, and tried to use those QTLs to predict tenderness. So um, obviously uh, that didn't work very well. But one of the things that was interesting is that the across-breed uh, QTL selection worked better than a within-breed QTL selection. The other question that we had is uh, how many of these QTLs should we use in our uh, genomic predictions? And so we varied the number of QTLs from 160 all the way up to 3,000. And basically, um, regardless of, of the breed, uh, and across all of the breeds, uh, 500 to 1,000 QTLs uh, tended to work best. Uh, so if you had too few QTLs, you weren't picking up enough of the signal. If you, and, and what we assume is that you, if you had too many QTLs, you were adding back too much noise into the genomic prediction. We, so, so this was for one trait, the meat tenderness. We repeated this for, for marbling, and so even though we have uh, different genetic architectures for these two different traits, uh, we saw this same trend of 500 to 1,000 QTLs working best. Okay, so for our trait marbling, um, we fit genomic predictions where we fit all of the available SNPs. So for this data set, that was about 38,000 SNPs. We fit the predictions where we had haplotypes as the effects, and so we saw an improvement from fitting all of the SNPs to using haplotypes as an effects, and so we could have just concluded that it was the haplotypes that was uh, bringing us that improvement. Um, luckily, I got to review a paper that did some feature selection, and, and from reviewing that pr paper, realized that it could be uh, the feature selection that was driving that improvement. And so we fit just the 5,000 SNPs that were used to, in those 1,000 QTL regions, and that tended to give us even better uh, genomic prediction correlations. And so once again, this trend was um, w happened regardless of, of the trait that we were looking at. So one of the things that we're really concerned about as animal breeders is that when you create a genomic prediction, you don't want it to be biased. You want to make sure that it, it works and it's going to um, give the breeders uh, a reliable estimate of genetic merit. And so here I've done three different plots for the three different uh, training groups uh, from the K-means clusters. And when we use all of the SNPs, especially in that third cluster, um, you see that we're probably overfitting uh, breed effects in this genomic prediction. So we have that uh, separation between the Herefords in the red and the rest of the data set that have Angus dams. 
the, the slope of the, so we took the progeny's performance and we regressed those on the sire's uh, genomic prediction. So the sire were genotyped, but we didn't have phenotypes for the sires. And uh, so, so we're just basing that on uh, th their genotype information. And, and you can see in that slope column that we have quite significant bias in this um, prediction. Uh, we did this same sort of analysis for the haplotypes, and again, especially for that cluster three, the uh, bias due to overfitting those breed effects got even worse. Um, so the haplotypes are tended not to be shared across breeds, and so we had even more ability to pick up breed effects. Uh, and again, that slope column from the table, we had even more uh, extreme bias. So even though um, we had gone through some uh, pre-selection, so, so we could have had some winner's curse from doing that QTL selection, um, we don't see that. In fact, we actually see that the bias is reduced when we do that feature selection. So in terms of the models we fitted, the bias is, is the best, is, is the most favorable for that feature selection model. Uh oh. So in some of our future work, we've genotyped uh, samples from this project from four additional breeds, and we're going to use those to um, further validate the model. So in this cross-validation work, um, the breeds that uh, contributed to create training the genomic prediction are also used for the validation. This new data will give us a completely independent validation. Uh, so, so basically the conclusions that I would make is that uh, the feature selection appears to have a greater impact than the use of the haplotypes. Um, the feature selection gives us the least bias, and this adds to, um, you know, some of Mario's work that he talked about, and also other work in packages like GFBLUP that shows that feature selection is um, perhaps some low-hanging fruit for improving these genomic predictions. And so this work was led by um, Miranda Wilson, my master's student here in the red, and I think I have time for some questions. Feature selection seemed to give the best results, if I understood this right, indicate that probably a lot of the QTLs uh, involve cases where there's more than one SNP affecting the, the alleles at particular genes. This is something I've been thinking about a lot. In other words, there's not uh, one SNP explaining the whole effect of a QTL. I think it's actually the opposite of what you're thinking. So if there were multiple alleles at a QTL affecting uh, variation in the phenotypes, the haplotypes would probably do a better job of picking up those multiple alleles. And, but what we see, and in fact, one SNP per QTL does a better job than having multiple SNPs or haplotypes per QTL. So I think it's basically dropping noise from the prediction and increasing your signal to noise ratio. Um, I was just wondering because genomic selection is kind of a black box in a lot of ways where people are selecting based on markers and ignoring the underlying structure and genes. And as a consequence, there's a lot of issues with antagonistic traits and uh, incorrectly selecting for them. And do you think this is like a kind of a vague question, but do you think that we need to start shifting away from this marker-based approach to try and resolve these anti antagonistic traits and that a more systems biology where we're looking at the biology underlying these QTLs is where we really need to start shifting towards? Um, I'm not sure I completely understand uh, your question, um, but I'll do my best to answer it. So. I think in, in, in terms of, of unintended consequences, is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, that would be along the lines. Um, like I know, you know, selective breeding programs try and control for this now, but there is still a residual issue with uh, like unresolved antagonistic traits or knock-on effects when you're 
ignoring the selection for a gene that is uh, regulated by many other genes or regulates many other genes? Yeah, so I think the, the adage that in, in the age of genomics, phenotype becomes king. Uh, I think it's more important that we collect that phenotype information to, to be able to disentangle those uh, genetic antagonisms. Thank you, Jared.